Um, as we started to do a little research on edges, you know, sort of historically around the city, you know, we started to see that even in places like Astoria, uh, even 100 years ago, you had people out in canoes right off of Hellgate. We started to see that historically there was much more of a connection to the water than there is today. Uh, and even off the east side of Manhattan, where the United Nations now is, you had people swimming at an area called Sutton Beach. You had people out in rowboats. So even well into this century, we had sort of a real feeling that you could do all of these things in the water at the same time without having to keep all these uses apart from each other. Um, but over the course of the 20th century, really, as we've become sort of a land-focused city, subways, bridges, waterfront highways, you know, we've really allowed old piers to fall apart. Uh, and so many sites along the Harlem River neglect and decay. I mean, this is a great spot uh, for a couple people, but you know, not a really public place as, uh, as many of us would like to go. And even where we've you know, sunk a lot of money, and when I say we, I mean sort of we as a city, whether it's private sector interests, government interests, others, just build a new target at the end of uh, just across the Broadway Bridge uh, in the Bronx, but didn't really use that as an opportunity to try to create a new access point to get down to the water. And it's a real shame that we're not using that as an opportunity to create a way to get to the water. So a little bit closer to the project area, in our sort of survey of edge issues, we found things like riprap, you know, big boulders that are basically set up to keep the land sort of in place. Um, there are sort of pilings that are often set up, in this case, to keep barges or tugboats from crashing into the highway. Uh, and then in many places, you've either got concrete or steel uh, seawalls, which, you know, again, are great for keeping highways from falling in, or not so great, depending on who builds them, but uh, don't really create the sort of access to the water or the environmental improvement as we're trying to facilitate here. As we found on our, uh, our site visit, we came aboard uh, our old police boat, which we keep down at West 23rd Street. And in the whole project area of Harlem River Park, you know, there was only one little place where we were able to pull up in a boat. And that's our little boat, which is you know, not even the size of a school bus. And, uh, and to imagine that you know, how many uh, religious organizations or schools or other community centers are here, you know, if you wanted to go out on a circle line, which passes right up the Harlem River three, four times every day, you can't get picked up or dropped off anywhere, you know, really north of 90th Street. And to me, that's, that's a real lost opportunity. And what we're seeing all over the city is that you can have in the same space sort of shared use of the waterways, where the commercial stuff is happening there and the recreational stuff is happening right there. And I hope uh, through today's workshop we can find ways for you know, the, that variety of uses to coexist right here on the Harlem River. Uh, my name is Richard Toussaint. I am with the Riverton Tenants Association, and uh, I am responsible for the concept of the Harlem River Park. Uh, we had no access or to the waterfront up this way other than the 135th Street and 139th Street uh, ramp. So I put together a proposal to have the waterfront developed from 142nd Street, close to where we are now, going south to 127th Street. There were other community-based organizations that were basically right on the waterfront or how, had housing developments on the waterfront. I also incorporated them into the plan to make sure that they knew that this piece of valuable real estate was there and for the tenants in those developments and for the people in New York City and, and Central Harlem and East Harlem to utilize. So where are we today? Uh, in the year 2000, November 15th, a proportion of the parkland between 135th Street and 139th Street was completed and dedicated. The Waterfront Alliance uh, came to the task force with the presentation that we're going to be dealing with today, and that is how to put a, uh, a water's edge on some of the areas, because uh, we had in 19, I believe 1997, the state DOT 
build a proportion of the park at 142nd Street in the Harlem River, and the bulkhead has fallen in. Three years later, bingo, in the water. Okay? So that will be discussed today, and um, the future development of the park uh, will be discussed today. We need to brainstorm some ideas and concepts. As I say, concepts are free. What you do with the concept, what you do with the gift, is up to us. This project is an attempt to look intensively at the seawall issues and the edge of the water in a way which we have never done at the Parks Department before. What we did was we convened a group of short-term consultants to come and assist us in thinking of some new approaches to the seawalls. Historically, Harlem River had a very different appearance, uh, as did the rest of the harbor. This is a shot of the Harlem River from probably the mid-1800s. It's from a Courier and Ives uh, illustration that shows the McCombs Dam and wetlands on both sides of the river and extensive green connection between the upland and the waterfront before there were seawalls constructed. You can see that originally the, um, the shoreline was very different. It wasn't straight. It wasn't um, a simple line. It was a complex line. There were inlets. There were islands. There were um, shallow areas along the length of it. And um, what, uh, there were also a variety of recreational uses over the history of uh, the river. Rowing was a, a very big deal, especially north on the north part of the Harlem River, a little north of where our, our site is. And uh, this is from about 1890 or so. And speeding on ahead, this is an illustration from when the Harlem River had a racetrack along the Manhattan side. And people would get out here in their carriages and pandemonium, and they would bet, and all kinds of you know, vice and sin, and all kinds of stuff going on. And um, so <laughs> there was these, this shipping during the industrial period um, caused the um, city to straighten out the river, harden the edges with seawalls so that ships could come up adjacent to it and unload their cargo without having to go down to a lower level than back up. So on, along especially the Manhattan length of the Harlem River, seawalls were uh, constructed to facilitate shipping. Harlem River Park was a master plan that was generated by this community, and then they convinced the Parks Department to take it on and finalize the design and construct it. Phase one from 135th Street to 139th Street, and phase two will continue on to the north. As you can see, it's a skinny, skinny strip between Harlem River Park Highway and the river itself. It's a very narrow zone. This is. Um, approximately uh, 50 feet or so at its, uh, at its wide part. Interestingly, above that level, or north of that, the park space widens out. And so when we were considering where should, the, uh, should this effort for designing the edge draw its boundaries, I said, oh, let's, let's look at this too, because there is um, an opportunity there, perhaps, to do something interesting since you have a little bit more space. We're very, um, we really basically locked into the idea of something pretty close to vertical in that narrow space in order to accommodate the bicycle greenway path that is um, the major, the heart of Harlem River Park. So, in looking at examples of, of what the Harlem River looks like, um, we took a boat trip to look at what the conditions are along the length of the harbor. And ecologically, there are a wide, wide variety of situations there. They range from the nearly pristine natural interface with the water, rocky areas that are tens of thousands of years old, that are covered with forest and have lots of cracks and crevices where vegetation can get established and have a lot of wildlife habitat value and have this scenic value that uh, other parts are, are quite different. We also have marshland. Uh, there are some pocket marshes um, along 
the Bronx side of the Harlem River, and some on the Manhattan side, a little north of where we are. Um, but there are these wetland mudflats and marsh wetland um, environments, which are extremely uh, biologically rich and very, very different than the industrialized portions. And then we have some areas which are, biologically speaking, very sterile because they were not intended to be parkland. They were never intended for public access. They were certainly never intended for kayakers or canoers to get out. They were intended to um, facilitate shipping. And so we have these, uh, a large section of the river in the area that we're considering is steel sheet walls. In other words, there's a, uh, a plate of corrugated steel, this crenellation, that's been driven down to harden the edge. And behind that is landfill. It's artificial land. The real shoreline, the original shoreline, was maybe a block or two back of that. So this is holding landfill, which is easily erodible once that um, wall is breached or compromised. Which brings us to the issue that What's happened here in the Harlem River is that at close to the low tide zone, it showed the corrosion of that steel sheet pile. And what, when steel sheeting like that is installed, it has a coating on it, which is resistant to salt water corrosion. But over the years, when it gets bumped and splashed and weathered and freezed and thawed and all of that, baked in the sun, and the, the coating um, gradually degrades, and once the coating is gone, the salt water that is the norm for the Harlem River can corrode that steel, it rusts essentially. We have also places where it looks like ice scour has basically come around like a, come along like a bulldozer and just scooped out a chunk of concrete along the length of the water and is compromising essentially the concrete seawall by taking a chunk of it away at a place which is uh, subject to pressure. So, okay, so this is our, this is our work site. And we have the uh, seawall, which is steel, and has a concrete cap or, you know, concrete top to it. But underneath that uh, is the steel. And in this area, what you can sort of see about six or seven feet below the ground, you can see water washing back and forth at low tide right under through the seawall. And what that's doing is it's washing away the landfill, sucking it out into the river, and allowing it to create these sinkholes. There are opportunities to fix it in the same usual way. In this case, though, we want to take a look and see if there might be a better way to do it. Could it be that there are some ways to rebuild these walls that are better than replacing them in kind? and maybe even cheaper, because to replace these type of industrial strength steel sheet walls is not cheap. And as you see, it doesn't last that long. In addition to the steel sheet wall with a concrete cap, we also have a section which is rock revetment, which is sloping. And the difference between the seawall approach here and the rock revetment um, is one is sloping, which is, makes a big difference uh, in terms of how the water behaves. Instead of smacking up against a vertical surface, it has a slope which can dissipate some of the wave energy. And we don't actually have waves here. It's just a narrow waterway. We have wakes, which are the, um, the wave-like water that comes from boats going by really quickly. Another thing about the difference is that it's porous. It's not uh, a solid wall. It allows some water to move back and forth across it. And it's also somewhat flexible as opposed to the wall. Those rocks can move a little bit, so there is some flexibility built in. So are there some models that we could use? Are there places that we could look at nature and use that as a model for doing a new type of wall? In places where there are rocky shores, water is held when the tide goes out. Water is held in these little puddles that are uh, very interesting and uh, kind of a gentle uh, way for people to get close to the water without actually being out there next to the current. When you have tide pools, you can come along and see 
the animals and the fish, which are trapped at low tide here, but then when the tide comes back up, they're washed back or re-submerged. Re um, so there might be a possibility that we could build in a way to get people close to the water without being dangerous by thinking of tide pools. Um, light is a major controlling factor in the biology of what lives in the water. Plants, of course, need light, and so the algae in the light-rich zone, the upper part of the water body, no matter whether it's this river or any other river, where the light can penetrate, green plants can grow, and things that eat green plants will be there as well. And so in this case, we're looking at, and what's missing generally along urban waters is the intertidal zone, the area that is shallow and that gets uh, a lot of light over the course of the day. And so what we're looking at here is a little bitty shallow area on the top of this um, timber structure that compared with what we're seeing elsewhere along this wall is very rich with crabs and with fish and with probably a lot of other things that we can't see but which are attracted to that light, uh, that, that zone that has sunlight coming into it. Um, there also is a whole technology of green walls, walls which are intended to grow plants on the vertical. Usually we think of parks as being something that requires lots of space. We don't have a lot of space in the section of Harlem River Park that we're looking at, but we do have this vertical surface. Is it possible that we could use some of these models to change that vertical surface to something which holds plants, which has soil with microorganisms that can digest some pollutants. Could we have a wall system which actually is actively helping to improve the water quality? Under the water, there are many urban environments which support lots of life. Uh, pilings, wood pilings um, are colonized by all kinds of interesting critters and plants, some of which are filter feeders. And what they do is they attach and they just spend their entire lives pumping water through their little bodies and taking out some of the sediment, taking out some of the compounds, uh, pollutants, which are harmful to us and may be harmful to those shellfish as well. But they can ab absorb some of them and take them out of the water column. Um, another aspect of walls which attract a lot of growing things is that they're rough textured and they have lots of places where things can get attached to, as opposed to, if you remember the steel sheet wall, smooth, rigid, and very hard to attach to. Natural walls have a, an ability to let critters get attached. And if we construct places that have terraces, as opposed to strictly vertical surfaces, those terraces are very important, and we actually observe this in the Harlem River um, the sections that have a little bit of a ledge on the seawall had a lot of algae growing on them and were attracting um, other th uh, things to grow in these uh, little horizontal spaces. So even though you have a narrow space, if we can at least make little ledges along the length of the river, that's quite a lot of surface area. Oysters and mussels are some of the organisms which can filter, uh, which do filter uh, water. These kinds of organisms, mussels and, and oysters, are also edible. And as we know, they are very subject to being contaminated. You do not want to eat contaminated shellfish. It's a couple of other things we might want to think about in considering some new ideas for the shapes of the wall. In intertidal and areas where waves and ice scour and, and a lot of wave action, a very and turbulent environment, causes animals to adapt to that. Um, the ones that are able to survive that kind of environment have some interesting characteristics which we might be able to draw from in considering a man-made system. A lot of them have these aerodynamic forms. They're kind of sleek um, and uh, curved. So, and what that does is when water hits something like this, instead of breaking apart, it slips by. It smoothly flows over that smooth f form. Maybe we could consider copying some of those techniques in a man-made system. There, there is also some other aspects of the way 
uh, certain organisms operate when they attach to rocks, which seems to work with this system as well. Many of them have conical shapes. They're sort of like a little cone that gets stuck on the wall. Um, so that water splits apart. Instead of smacking up against it, it kind of splits, splatters across it. And then they're clustered, which I think is a very evocative idea that there might be elements which we link together in clusters uh, that are, is, would give a very different appearance than the, the steel sheet wall. And they're nonlinear. All of the natural systems that I looked at, rocky shores, these organisms, they all don't have straight lines and right angles. They have nonlinear organization. So this is our work site. This is phase one here. Phase two begins here. And so our work site goes from here. And here's that little uh, edge. Here's our riprap area. Goes from here to the next bridge. A marine biologist is a person who studies marine organisms in the ocean or in the sea. Um, and I study those marine organisms near the shoreline and into the shore. I am interested where organisms are found and what brings them there and why they grow in certain locations. So what things may limit the abundance of certain organisms. In particular, things that interest me are, are things like crabs and snails and barnacles and, and, and uh, clams and things of that sort. What occurred to me at first was that a great opportunity to poke around in different cracks and crevices. So I found several different types of animals and plant life there. I really didn't, didn't know what to expect, but it uh, was nonetheless exciting to me. Um, it's certainly been noted in a variety of different locations that the water quality has improved along the Harlem River, and that's probably a part of the reason why these other organisms have popped up in this region here. Um, and the possibility of any alteration of habitats made it quite interesting to me that perhaps, you know, what you make of the habitat might influence what might come there and what, what, how interesting it might be to observe those habitats. In a location like this near the shore, uh, tides do play an important role and they, they influence our access to the shore and what you can see there. So at certain times of the day the water will be very high and up to the terrestrial or land and other times of the day it will be much lower. Um, that provides uh, a region called the intertidal that's the region between where the high tide is, where the water is at the high end to the low end. When the tide goes out, it allows access to that. So during periods of low tides, people can go down and look at organisms. Um, there are a couple of considerations uh, looking at these type of uh, habitats. It's the type of bottom habitats. You can go the realm of very solid surfaces, whether it's sea walls or riprap or rock surfaces where you can actually stand on versus ones which are very soft. And the ones, soft ones, are the ones you're going to sink in when you walk in through these habitats. Um, it becomes an important difference because certain organisms will be found in soft habitats, soft bottom habitats, very muddy, and others in very solid habitats. So far, we've been talking about solid habitats where you can actually see the organisms on the surface, as opposed to the muddy, soft ones, which, which usually burrow into the surfaces. Um, and, and it's harder to see those type of organisms. And lastly, there's a linkage, too, between these bottom-dwelling habitats and also the water column nearby. And I think that's already been uh, referenced in terms of water quality issues and where organisms move and so forth. All right, these organisms, uh, there's things like these oysters, which live on these surfaces, uh, or barnacles, which live on the oysters themselves, and there's mud flats or mud stuff nearby. These ha habitats are in here, and they're very, very active. They scurry around all over the place. You turn over a rock, and they run all over the place. And they, they're fairly easy to handle and don't really attack people very much. They're not big enough to be eaten either. Uh, but they are something you can keep looking for. So here's a list of just some different organisms I found living around those locations. The top three organisms there are found on rocky surfaces around there. This Asian shore crab running around. Um, ivory barnacle was quite abundant on different types of habitats. Uh, rib mussels, it's a small clam that's on attached to some of these rocks. There's also some different types of algae and different plants attached there. We noticed some fish swimming by, some silver sides, we saw, and of course shorebirds may come by as well. Um, in a lot of ways, the slope of the shoreline influences what types of organisms might be there. 
everything from something very vertical like the sea walls, which will have certain organisms living on there like barnacles perhaps. Uh, as you get uh, more of an angled slope, to you may have boulders and bigger rocks and maybe nooks and crannies and crevices to cobble beaches. And as you get slower and lower down, you have more sand flats and mud, muddy areas. Tide pools are already, al already mentioned as well as a type of habitat that might be found. Uh, various types of slopes if you have pockets of water at low tide. Um, when you engineer habitats, when you make different types of habit habitats, different types of organisms will come. Uh, this is an example of an oyster reef much further south in the coastline, but an example of, of when you design certain habitats, you get certain types of organisms there. So what you design may lead to what you end up finding. Thank mm -hmm. you.